Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Lisa Polisain. I'm the Education and Community Engagement Manager at Blue Light Arts, and I'm so grateful to have you with us today for uh, our first session of Artist Toolbox 101. This program came together after our last program we did last year called Skills How to Apply. We had so many questions towards the end of the program and we recognized that there was a gap in knowledge that we thought was important to try to fill as best as we could. Um, that session was organized by myself and Ashley Artists of Creative Capital. And in, that, in those thoughts, we really thought it was important to try to talk about a lot of the topics that we're going to, we've decided to break down for this, how to apply this um, Artist Toolbox program. Um, I'm really thankful to have my two guests with me today, Monica Lucerovich and Tori Arpad-Kata. They're two people that I've learned a lot from along the way uh, as an artist, as a student at FIU, with Tori and then um, as a colleague with Monica at the Miami Rail. So um, Tori Arpad Kata is a professor at FIU in the uh, art and art history department and she's a site-based ceramicist. ceramicist. Uh, she's attended residencies nationally and has been awarded the Florida State Cultural Council Artist Fellowship as well as the NCECA Emerging Artist Award. Monica Sarevich is a writer and photographer based right here in Miami. Um, and her writing has appeared in publications like Art Forum, Bomb, Cultured, and of course, The Miami Rail. So uh, please join me in welcoming Monica and Tori to the virtual stage, Zoom stage. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I like the, the like slight Zoom delay where we have to like wait for everybody uh, to load. Like a curtain. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to talk a little bit more about yourself um, and what your, why you're, you're here to tell. Here we go. Hi. <laughs> Do you want to start us off, Monica? Uh, sure. Um, well, even though um, I'm primarily a writer, I'm also a visual artist. So I have some experience in applying for things that would require a bio. And by virtue of being a writer here in this city, I have looked at a lot of biographies, a lot of CVs. I have edited a lot of college applications, um, a lot of residency applications just for friends. But I've been doing this for so many years. It started to become kind of like a side gig. And it's, it's a really nice privilege because I get to learn about so many people here, but I also have gained some experience in learning about what uh, um, different institutions are looking for and how to encourage people in this process that can be daunting, but doesn't have to be, I think. Um, yeah, great. Um, I am really privileged also to be here with you guys. And I thank Michelle for in inviting me and Monica for being willing to chat, the two of us to chat today. Um, I've been teaching at FIU for a long time. I think it's over 20 years now. And while I have clearly written some of this stuff for my own professional practice, I've worked with countless students. And I think one of the things that always hits me is that if there was a single right way to put this stuff together, there'd be a template for that and we would all know it. We wouldn't have to do this program, right? And so I think we're trying to come at this from the point of view that it's something that all of us can do, that it isn't worth um, sweating over, um, that it's easier to do than you think, and that each of us as artists has a unique profile that will fit into these formats of things like CVs and those and you know the other workshops that Elite is is um, hosting in the upcoming weeks that will show what how what you do is unique and interesting and hopefully we can help you guys um, move in that direction of being able to put those things together easily. So. For sure, I think for me also a big part of this was understanding that uh, a college education and the internships and all the stuff that I did in a lot of ways for is a privilege and a lot of people don't have access to doing those things, but still want to be artists. And so being able to put together a program like this, that kind of not only say evens the playing fields, but gives people the opportunity to feel 
like they can compete in these spaces that often feel kind of um, rampant with like nepotism and privilege in ways that uh, can kind of make you feel smaller than you are as artists. Um, especially since I think the biggest part of all of this for me was realizing that people thought took the CV in a way that was so similar to like a, a, a job resume. Um, and I think that's like a big part of why I was realizing that maybe there was there was more that needed to be discussed in this way. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the um, presentation. I think we can go get started. All right. So. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Yeah. Oh, okay. There, it's a click. Okay. So I guess we can start with like, what is a CV? <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, Monica, do you want to, should we do this like a tennis match? We'll just kind of bounce this back and forth. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start and then, you know, maybe we can just uh, pass back and forth. Does that sound yeah, good to you? Let's do okay, that. perfect. Start and volley it back. All right. Perfect. So Michelle had mentioned that a lot of people uh, confuse the CV with the sort of resume that people in other fields write when they're looking for particular kinds of jobs and they have to write little narrative blurbs about their, their productivity or their achievements in their last jobs and how it might fit with the new job that they're doing. And that's really not what we do, I think, at all in the arts. Um, and in a lot of ways, we're lucky for that because the C and, and CV, CV and resume are both words too that although they mean different things, um, people tend to use somewhat interchangeably. And so rather than getting hung up on what's the official definition, I think we're gonna encourage you to just make sure that whenever you're applying for something and someone is asking you for a CV or a resume, you're just really clear about what they're asking for from you. Um, generally speaking, the CV is longer and the resume is a shorter one. Um, but like I said, sometimes people interchange them. Most of us keep a long form, whatever name we give to it, that is the list of everything we've done in the history of our practice as an artist. Um, and then we have a shorter form that, and in the beginning, if you're young, uh, young, uh, young at heart or young in age and you're just starting in your career, you might not have such a long one, um, but over time, you know, you edit down to those. And we're going to go over what sorts of things go on your resume or CV, um, what sort of order they can go in, and, um, and how to tweak those things de depending on the opportunity that you're, that you're going to look for. So um, I'm going to, I think I've covered what we've got on this page. If uh, Monica, maybe you want to start us on the next one. Um, this will come up maybe throughout the entire conversation, but it's important to consider why you're submitting a CV. Um, this, this goes back to what we were saying in the beginning to not sweat these things too much, especially if your CV is not that long. Um, for some of you it is, for others, maybe you haven't participated in a lot of exhibitions or events or things that you would eventually add to a CV. And that's okay because in our experience, as we've been discussing prior to this conversation, um, the CV just forms a large, just forms a larger package that includes your actual artwork, your bio, your statement, whatever, whatever it is you're compiling <laughs> together. And the CV itself is just one small part of that. Um, and I think this is something else we were discussing. There's a lot of pressure to uh, brand yourself now um, as an artist, um, especially in our, in our very uh, social media heavy world. Um, and that can contribute to some of the stress about you know, the importance of what these things say about you and do they represent you very well. Um, and you just have to trust that everything you're submitting will put that together for people and you don't have to use each individual component to express yourself the best way. It just has to be very, it just has to be cohesive. Um, so, in regards to this question, how do institutions utilize the CV? I think they're just looking it over just to get a better sense of you. Yeah, yeah I think that's the really big part of it is that I, I think 
when I was asking people for CVs for things um, or, you know, for different opportunities, I realized that they felt like this kind of like, um, maybe like a bit of a panic about it because in so many ways, a CV or a resume, and because it's used so interchangeably, it's hard, it's like becomes this thing. A resume is like the end all be all, you know, when I think of those like, um, what is it, the API systems that jobs use to scan your resume. And a lot of people think that that's kind of just like how we're looking at it in the same way. Um, but it's just not, it's just not the same type of, it's not the same thing, you know, um, this is not a marketing job. This isn't like that kind of situation where um, it's very like regimented and we can like, there's like rules and everything. It's like, like Tori said, there's not like a exact template for every single thing you're supposed to do. And for the same, for that reason, we have an opportunity, I think, to use every part of this package as like the selling point for ourselves. And it doesn't have to be focused on just the one thing. Um, but yes. <laughs> so what should your CV include? The big, right? the big question. So Right. So eventually we'll show you a few CVs just as examples of how they can look differently. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that um, your CV is really pretty factual, right? It's going to be things that are true and there's going to be information about you because whatever you're applying for, the folks to whom you're applying need to know, you know, who you are. And eventually as we get to the next sections, um, the folks you're applying to will need to know about what you've done. So about you, clearly your name. Now, as a university <laughs> professor, I can attest that although this seems really obvious, a great many times people work really hard on the content of what they're submitting, and then you receive it and there's no name on it. And, you know, if I know them, I might be able to guess who they are. But yeah, put your, say, you know, your name um, or your pseudonym. You know, there are people like, Patrick Doherty, uh, um, uh, uh, Patrick Ireland, Brian Doherty, right? Who's a painter and writer, and I forget which one of him is which now. Um, <laughs> but right, but it's it's the same person, but has a completely different name for each of his, you know, sort of separate identities as an artist or as a writer. Um, I stick with my own name most of the time. Um, you know, so, and I think that's true for most of us. Email is important. Your phone number, um, this I think depends on what you're applying to and how public that CV or resume is gonna be once you've submitted it. Um, you know, some of us are, are lucky enough to have a phone number that isn't our own personal phone that's gonna ring us out of bed in the middle of the night, but not everybody has that. Um, your social media where applicable, you know. Um, your birth year is sometimes relevant, although if you're applying for academic jobs, that's a big no-no because asking about people's ages, their marital status, um, all those other kinds of personal questions are really off limits. Um, your place of residence, uh, your place of birth can be interesting, um, especially if it's relevant to the work that you do. The, your place of birth might be something that you would include if you have a website. And then your education, if it's applicable. Um, although I'm coming, obviously I teach at FIU. I've been there for a long time. I think you know, going through a college art program has all sorts of benefits. There's nothing saying that, um, that education is required. We are not um, MDs. We are not lawyers. We are not um, accountants. We, we don't require a certification. Um, unless, of course, you're applying for one of those academic jobs, in which case your uh, terminal degree all of a sudden is something that everybody's looking at. But these are all <laughs> the things about you. Make sure they're accurate, right? Um, you don't ever want to send this information out with, um, in, with any details that would be wrong, right? In, intentionally or not so. Right. Um, and, you know, then in the next slide, I think Monica uh, will cover some of the things that are more about your work than about you. And this is a really interesting list she's got here. Well, it's a very, the reason this list is long is not because you need to include all of this, but because you can include any of this as it's applicable. Um, <clears throat> and so 
we put education here also um, in addition to placing it in the more biographical factual information because again it's not always applicable maybe you didn't go to school it doesn't I, I dare say I, do, I don't think it matters all the time if, if any right. of the time um, and something to keep in mind that again may come up later um, like Tori was saying it's good to start keeping kind of an archive of everything you've ever done, whether it was an exhibition at a friend's house, some kind of event you've done, anything at all that would fall under the umbrella of your practice. And as you start to build that list, you may notice that the CVs that you actually send out as part of applications for different projects or residencies or what have you get shorter. Maybe there, maybe you pick and choose based on what you're applying for. Maybe there's a certain project you participated in or panel you participated in that's completely relevant to what you're applying for and you're really proud of it and you want to showcase it. Maybe some other things you're not so proud of or you don't or you just don't want to include. So it's very um, She's your own adventure, so to speak. So we wanted to include all of this so that you could see all of it counts. Um, exhibitions, panels, residencies, awards. If you haven't won them, it doesn't matter. It doesn't go on there. Um, something to note here, you'll see the bibliography. There's um, make, make sure that you make the distinction between things you wrote and things that were written about you. That's important, that can get confusing. That's something that comes up on my CV sometimes because I've been interviewed as a photographer, but I've also contributed lots of writing. So I separate that and I actually have two different CVs that I toggle between myself. Um, and you'll notice at the end of this, we mentioned references. That of course is only if it's requested. Um, and something I want to volley back to Tori actually is the difference between making a CV that actually just contains your things about your art practice and events you've done underneath that or as part of that and something that contains more employee type work, resume type work. This is where that differentiation comes up because sometimes a job you've had a more air quotes traditional job does fall under this and kind of makes sense to include on your CV but sometimes you don't have to you know right. yeah I think that's a really good uh, a, a good thing to point out Monica especially in the beginning when we're putting resumes together and CVs together <coughs> um, if we don't have a big long list of exhibitions then we try to figure out what else goes there and I know on my very first CV when I was first starting um, I had two jobs that were creative in different ways, one of which was that I was doing some design work that had nothing to do with my own artistic practice per se, um, but I didn't have a lot of lines on the resume, and so the fact that I was working, you know, in design for a small magazine um, was in some cases useful. Um, mm -hmm. I also had written uh, a, an arts column for a local paper. Uh, one other writer and I took turns every other week for the weekly paper writing these arts columns. And in the beginning, that was a good thing to put on there because it gave people a sense that I was engaged in various different um, aesthetic and conceptual activities, uh, as well as my practice of making art in the studio and trying to get exhibitions. But in the beginning, you you know, you struggle to put together that, that one page. And so you try to think about, well, you know, have you been a counselor at a children's art camp? That doesn't sound tremendously important later on once you've started to have exhibitions and you're represented by a gallery. But in the very beginning, it might say something about you. Now, um, somewhere along the line, let's say you want to get a job where you're going to be running some kind of um, educational based program through an art center or something. The fact that you've maybe had some kind of teaching experience in the past might be useful. Whereas at that same point in your 
career when you're sending off your slot, you know, your, your portfolio to a curator to look at to consider you for an exhibition or you're applying for a grant to do a project, then, you know, your art camp experience is maybe not tremendously relevant. And so you can choose to include or not include those things, um, depending on, you know, where you're at, where you are at in your career, what, you know, what is your menu of options of the things you could include on your CV? And what are you applying for? What are they really looking for? And what is going to feel like filler in one case, but going to seem relevant in another case? And, you know, those are decisions that you can make. And of course, you can always run these things by your friends um, and your colleagues. And, you know, those of you who have contacts, I, I mean, I talk with alumni past students all the time about things that they're applying for, especially as you kind of get to new tiers of the importance of the things you're applying for. You know, a lot of times that's a good time to kind of check back in with people and say, hey, you know, I'm updating this. And now I'm applying for this more prestigious opportunity. You know, what, how does this look? You know, should I make changes? Um, yeah, show your friends. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. In almost every step of these, this process, you could show your friends, and you should. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, the addition. When you said show your friends, this, oh yeah, we go to this slide now. <laughs> this list is long, and will be available after right. the talk too. Yeah, and I did also share um, a, ahead of time the supplemental sheet that we made mm -hmm. so people can kind of have a view of that as well. Um, but yeah, it was really, I really appreciated you mentioning um, those, those things, Tori, because as a person who has like, and I think that's <coughs> part of, partly, partially why I asked the people that I did for this program, because there are people with a lot of overlap in their resumes and their CVs, like they do multiple things. And as an artist slash arts administrator, I've had to think about that pretty actively when it comes to what I include on what CV. Um, you know, for a job, I'm not showing them the exhibition history. It's a little, it might feel weird, you know, it might feel strange to include that, but there are contexts where they want to know that I'm an artist and they want to know what I've done as an artist. So sometimes when I've been asked, I'll send two, I'll send them both. And you can kind of have a look at both of them. Um, so it's, I really think it's important to really, hone in on the fact that like there's not one for everything that there's going to be instances where you're going to be doing some editing for sure yeah so yes <laughs> um but right. yeah so this additional notes page is something that we all thought was really important to include because i thought there are certain things that i think get lost on people um like saying like your unofficial things like what what could that, like, I guess, what would you consider an unofficial thing that people think should be included on your CV? I keep using the example of putting, of having an exhibition in somebody's house. Um, <laughs> and I also remember when I was in school, when I was like my, in my final year of college, I mean, I studied psychology, but I happened to participate in a rogue, if you'll call it that, art show with a bunch of other students, some of whom went to the design school that was part of my college. So I included that even though it was, you know, impromptu, um, things like that. I, and I, and I, that also connects to what we were talking about before about jobs you've had that might be relevant. Um, I think there's a lot of space for what is considered relevant or <laughs> even, <laughs> even, even if, and I, and I bring this up as someone who's always personally felt a little unsure of myself in institutional spaces and academic spaces um, while applying for things like this. Uh, I tend to get very nervous myself and unsure, but t reminding myself that anything, um, a lot of the things I've done can be um, included on my CV is really comforting. So that's why I included that note. Um, think anything almost anything you've done counts if, if you want it if it's relevant to, to what you're applying for um right some you know sorry I didn't mean to cut you off Tori. yeah no no I was I was kind of jumping in jumping in on on you there um I think that's tremendous important it also brought up something that we really didn't talk about before was this idea of exhibitions 
in the beginning, we often have a lot more exhibitions that are impromptu, that are, you know, a group of friends got together and we decided to do that rogue show. Um, or we found a space or, you know, like when Art Basel first started coming around and any empty space anybody could find, we put up art, right? Um, and over time, you start doing things. I mean, some people spend a lot of money paying their juried applications to get into juried shows, which is one way of having some sort of outside arbiter. But eventually, you start to, instead of doing rogue shows or things you've sort of paid to have your work looked at, um, which I don't necessarily recommend as the best way, but eventually there, you start to either get gallery representation or there are curators who are curating your work into exhibitions or you're invited to have an exhibition. And so within that category of exhibitions, there's a sort of ranking of which are the more prestigious um, in terms of how your work was chosen to be in these opportunities, as well as what are the venues where they are. In the beginning, you want everything you can think of, you know? Um, and over time, you start to replace some of those less prestigious opportunities with ones that are more. Um, on the other hand, sometimes if you have, you know, I know I work with a lot of students who might both do object-based or installation-based work, but they might also do performance, right? And so some of the things that are on their list of exhibitions or performances are less about the object. And so if you're applying to an opportunity that is gonna be focusing on one or the other, you might then edit in terms of, you know, the, the type of work that is in your list of exhibitions, you know, performances, what have you, um, rather than just looking at the prestige level or even the chronological, you know, what's, what are the most recent. Um, so there are a lot of ways to, you know, to take your pie of your history of what you've done and slice it up and reorganize it to, you know, not to make anything up, but essentially to just sort of repackage it so that it, it makes a better presentation for certain opportunities. Yeah, and the actually the next three notes, the next three bullet points on this list are kind of part of one cohesive idea, which is just start archiving everything you've done, put it on an external hard drive, put it in a Microsoft Word document, put it on Google Drive, you know, and just keep that list. It's, it's an archive or record of yourself. And you can, like Tori was saying, you can start, you're going to have to start editing. You're going to have to start picking and choosing um, eventually, but you need that for yourself. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be a long CV, but you should have a list or archive of everything you've ever worked on, even right. the things you don't like. You know? <laughs> yeah. You think you're not going to forget them, but you're gonna forget things that you've done. You will. You will. Uh, you mentioned like you worked at a kids' youth camp, and I was like, oh my god, I worked at a kids' youth camp. <laughs> yeah. I, I completely forgot, and it was like a whole summer of my life that I spent there, and I completely forgot that I did that. I did that in college, you know. So I did that happened. too, and I forgot. <laughs> I said that. It's so weird. So yeah. So you, the the long CV is actually something that I I am very adamant about to all people is like doing the long CV thing because it's actually I I look at my long CV all the time and remember things that I completely just haven't thought about in years um so that's very very important so on the next couple of slides we have like a couple of examples that we thought we wanted to look at <laughs> maybe people are also curious about formatting like yeah. the, where the year goes what gets italicized what doesn't and we yeah. hope some of that will be answered just by looking at the different cvs because people do there is a basic format you'll see throughout and then you can see how people got creative with it you know yeah if they did some are straightforward like yeah most. i mean like with this one um it's also nice because we did one filmmaker and one artist and we have like a big artist also who see me that we can also have a look at. So I guess I can we like maybe talk about what's effective about this particular one. Well, one of the things I'll point out right away when you look at this one is 
we just told you a couple of slides back to put your name right and your your email and maybe your phone number that sort of thing and that's not on here right and so that should be a cue to those of us looking at this one that this Monica's CV, this particular version of it, was probably meant to be looked at in a more public way, right? The contact information isn't here. It was probably sent out to somebody. Maybe it's, it exists on her website, right? That anybody who goes on the web, traffics the website can go and take a look at. Or it might have been sent out with a cover letter or some other, you know, information that would include the contact information. But that's pretty typical when you're looking at a CV that is available to the general public where, you know, you don't necessarily want to make all your personal information fully public, right? Um, and so that, that I would point out. Um, but there's some interesting things about design here too. And I think the other thing that that I would throw in there is to not feel like you have to be a graphic designer or hire a graphic designer to make a CV that is legible and um, is and well organized. Um, you know, later I think we have one from Anne Hamilton, who of course is a very famous artist um, <laughs> who has whose short CV is very long. Um, but it's a really simple, straightforward typeface with no use of special color. Um, but the information is organized and, and tabbed out. And you can see how the dates are, the categories are prominent, the dates are prominent, and each of the entries includes what was the event or, or, or situation that's being referred to, um, and usually where it took, what it was, where it took place in terms of uh, venue, and where it took place in, in terms of geography. Um, and then your footnotes, you know, you can find um, uh, bibliography uh, formats online pretty easily, depending on whether we're talking about a TV interview or a magazine article, those kinds of things. I like to use um, the bibliography generators mm -hmm. and just, it, it's just way faster. <laughs> yep. And I really enjoy it. It just makes it so much easier on me. Um, so this next one is another um, artist. It's three pages, but this is the first two. Um, I just, this one, she had her contact information. I just took them off so that we didn't have her uh, address and phone number broadcasted for this. I don't know if that's something she right. was comfortable with. Um, but there was, I mean, you, I think Tori, you, it was you, I believe, who really appreciated that she took time to like also include her artist statement on the CV. Um, and also this is one of those CVs that's definitely more graphic centered. She definitely played with that one a lot. Right, I'm not, and I, and I can't speak to whether or not you have to include your artist statement. I think it depends again on what you want to showcase or what you have to showcase. Um, I know this is available on the artist's website, so she's including everything, you know. Um, I also, I was thinking that I can't really speak to whether or not it is required or important for you to have some kind of graphic flair on your CV, but I think that's really up to, up to you, you know, um, I don't, and I know I'm a writer, but I'm also a visual artist, and my CV personally does not have these details, because I don't know how to utilize them, I don't know how to do that, and um, I think in general, if you don't know how to do something, you don't have to force it or fake it um because both of the cvs we just looked at are look really good i think whether they have more more play as present here or if they're a little more straightforward like monica sorrell's yeah um did, so i'm gonna have to i'm gonna stop my screen share for a second mm -hmm. um because ann hamilton's uh <laughs> cv is so long i couldn't fit it into the so i have to do a different screen share for that one um i have that one open as well on a different screen because it's so long. And Hamilton, <laughs> we looked at both versions. The short one is four pages and the long one is, I think, 60, 60 pages, pages or something. <laughs> right. um, but I love the way she formatted it. <laughs> and we're not sharing this one as like a means to be like, yours, you got to wait, get to the 60 pages. You know, like that's not the thing. But we thought it was important to note that hers just is very simple. 
very, it looks great, but it's very, very simple. Um, I'm the, we're actually looking at the 60 page, as you see, we were not lying, it's 60 full pages. And I don't, so this is how I think. I don't know if everyone else thinks like this, but I just want to interject and say, it's not simple just because it's long. Even if yours is short, it can be simple. It's not that hers can afford to be simple because it's so long. I, I think that right. this is like, oh, of course hers can be simple. She has a million pages, but that's not right. true. I think this would look good as one page or less than a page as well. It's really easy for people to read this. You know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's just basic design, straightforward typeface, no fancy graphics, um, you know, appropriate line spacing between categories, tabs with enough space between where it says 2018 dash present before you get to the next thing. Just little things like that that um, make the whole thing really viewable at a glance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, and I think that's the other thing that's really important when you think about the CV. Monica already described how it's just one piece of the package that represents your practice, right? But I think we all know that as visual artists, it's our work that's going to be the thing that people are going to hopefully spend the most time on, right? And so, you know, that's where the biggest part of your energy goes into making that fabulous work. And then... <laughs> <laughs> These are the, 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 the supporting characters that give the information that can't be found just by looking at the work. Right. Um, right. And so the CV can be very straightforward, very straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> and it's totally okay to copy a template right? of someone you like and yeah. utilize that as your structure. I did that with a friend and I, found, and I told them and I found out they in turn had copied another friend's template and we were all, yep. it was like five people, just a chain of people <laughs> using that same template. So whatever works to help you get this information down, it's, it's, right. not, uh, it's not plagiarizing because it's your work that you're replacing it with, but right. sometimes you need help. With that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I guess now might be a good time to think about the um, artist bios. We haven't even gotten right. to those yet. So let me share my and screen. And we'll do all the questions at the end, right? Yeah. All the yeah. Q's and A's. Yeah. Okay. So who wants to kick us off about bios? Um, I guess, right. I think the big distinction between bios and statements, I think is really important to note um, and understanding that you should have one of each. <laughs> I, bios, um, can or, or an opportunity again, much like the CV, to be very factual. Of course, there are bios out there that again contain some information that you might find in an artist statement, a little bit about the artist practice. But it is, um, as Tori had said in one of our previous conversations, it's very much like that basic journalism question you learn in English class, like the who, what, when, where. Not, and not the why, not why you make this work, just who you are, where you're from, what, as you choose, of course, but it, the bio can be, again, very, very straightforward. Yeah, yeah. It's who you are as opposed to who your work is, mm -hmm. or who your work is, what your work is, right? <laughs> um, uh, and, and there are times, I mean, and you, if you look at enough catalogs, y'all do, you see that sometimes an exhibition is put together and what the, the curators have done in the catalog is kind of mashed that artist statement bio thing together. And so there are going to be times that no matter what distinction we tell you, you will find some exceptions to that. Um, but generally speaking, it's good to have these things discrete in your mind um, and I think also we're going to look at some that are are longer than they need to be um, I forget what our next slide looks like here uh -huh. um, Michelle all right the things to consider um, I'll start here because I think the the um, the second one is that really weird difficult question right that we had talked about in a prior conversation but the first thing is what do you want to say about yourself most of the time when you're asked for a bio, it's because people are interested. I mean, who's this person who made this work, right? Who, who are you? 
Um, and so you have to think about what do you want to share with people about who you are. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, where people were born is sometimes a really interesting thing, particularly if you're no longer working in the place that you were born, or sometimes because you are still working in the place where you were born and it's been a very long time, and that's also sort of unique. Um, but that second question of why are you the person who makes the work? Um, sometimes it's really simple. Um, sometimes that's such a big conundrum that it's almost unanswerable. So I would include in here to say, don't feel like your bio has to be clever. If you are clever, that's fantastic and you know, go for it. Um, I know I'm not, although I will say that I had one opportunity where I got to write a bio that instead of it sounding very you know, sort of conventional, I had been invited to share my work at a, um, a conference on women and water. And I had been doing all these projects about water. And so the fact that I was born in the city of Eau Claire, which in French means clear water, and that I was living along one body of water and my studio was along yet another body of water, gave me this opportunity to write thematically in the bio in a way that I have never had before or since. All of the other times I think the bio is really kind of straightforward. Um, and, you know, the next thing, the snippets from your CV, you'll see some examples from both my bio and Monica's bio, which are the sort of long forms. And you look in there and you say, well, are there, are there certain awards or are there certain exhibitions or are there certain practices or positions that you've had that are, are sort of the defining ones, right? That are the, the things that, that really say something about, about, um, about who you are and how that relates to the kind of work that you've chosen to do. Um, you probably have something to add in there, Monica. I mean, you're summarizing it very well, but um, that <laughs> with regards to that second question, why are you the person who makes your work? Um, you don't literally have to answer that in the bio. Right. Um, what we meant by that is who you are will be helpful in answering that. So this factual information will kind of, again, start to contribute toward this larger understanding of who you are. Um, Tori brought this up a few times when we were talking uh, previously, and I think it's really important to highlight it to avoid jargon or these big words or trends that don't necessarily connect to what you're doing. Um, I remember writing some of my earlier bios and feeling some kind of um, pressure once again, as I mentioned before, to brand myself a particular way. And it was not relevant to what I was doing. You know, I just wanted to take photos for really, for maybe very straightforward reasons. Um, if it applies to you, these um, larger ideas or as we put here, jargon, you can totally utilize it. But I think if, Generally speaking, especially as an editor, I keep this in mind, if something is confusing or becoming overwrought or you're really overthinking it, don't, don't do it or step away from it or um, don't be afraid to keep it simple. Oh, I didn't even realize we wrote that as I was <laughs> saying it. But I think that's very important because um, again, you don't want, you want it to be clear and you want it to be legible and you want it to be as honest as it can be. Um, and you do want it to reflect you, but you don't want it to be something that you obsess over or that becomes very confusing or distressing. You know? yeah. That's why you should share it with people too. Um, because sometimes we can't write about ourselves. It's really hard to do that. That's, I, I don't know how everyone else here feels, but that seems to be a commonality in, amongst a lot of people I've encountered that writing about ourselves is a very painful, uh, annoying, frustrating, and feels like you're hitting your head into a wall. And sometimes <laughs> just somebody who, who knows you, who's seen your work, who's seen you grow as a person, not only as an artist can look at it and tell you, actually, I think you should include this, or actually this is really good, you know? Yeah. I think yeah, I would 
I would agree. I think there's also a thing that we neglected to say, and maybe it's because it's one of those things that seems so obvious that we forget it, but bios are typically written in the third person. So oh, yeah. rather than saying, I was born in Eau Claire, I would write Tori Arpad Cotta was born in Eau Claire. Um, I think for most of us, it's really bizarre to write about ourselves in the third person. And so it's easier to put the ideas together first person and then to edit afterward <laughs> to get it back you know to the third person or to get a friend to sit down and imagine they're they're saying it but and i also wanted to add a little thing about the trendy like right now what i'm running into with a lot of my students is that everybody's weaponizing something and so, <laughs> <laughs> i just want you to think about right that although, you know, that's a really grand idea and there's certainly a lot of conflict in the world right now. And so maybe it's appropriate, but when it's the word that everybody is using, it's not going to be the language that helps your work to stand out as yours. And so if somebody just put in the, in the comments at the intersection <laughs> of, right. And that's a, and that's another one. And so there are, there are these kinds of things that if they, if you feel like you're hearing an echo, Right when you choose some of this language, be cautious about that. And there are times it's appropriate, right? There are times it's the best phrase because sometimes when one of those new phrases is coined, it is able to. It, it happens because it's able to say something that people hadn't articulated quite that way before. But then all of a sudden we all jump on that bus, and now we're all weaponizing, um, and you know that <laughs> that uh, that comes a little strange. So. You know, think and, and again, as Monica said, have somebody else, have a friend, read this stuff, right? Um, and come back to you or read it out loud to one of your friends and see if it sound they think it sounds like you, right? Is it something you could say? I think also we find I find that like when you read it out loud, if you you're fumbling over these words, because it's easy to write it down, but then trying to read it out loud sometimes. Uh, you realize that, oh, this string of words isn't something I would naturally say, or it's a string of words that just doesn't sound good. And right. the reader is oftentimes, most, most people, you know, read by hearing it in their head. And so it, you, you want that to have a flow that feels very easy and understandable. I, but I think um, when I was in college, the trendy word was juxtapose, and I would not <laughs> remember being in a critique where someone said juxtapose and hearing half the professors just groan <laughs> in the back of the room because it just been it had been getting used so regularly that it didn't even sound honest anymore. Even if the person was creating juxtaposition, it just doesn't sound honest anymore because it's such a trendy uh, a thought and word. <laughs> yeah, air on the side of not, and I'm not saying these words, you know, or ideas or concepts aren't simple. But um, with, with regard to everything, uh, err, you can err on the side of simplicity if you don't know. It's okay, it's okay to not say so much, I think. Um, that, the more I talk about this, the more I realize it seems to be my philosophy. It's okay to say less if you're not quite sure what to say in yeah. person, in your bio, in your CV. It's okay, you're, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> really as so long as you're um getting to the point in some in some way it's okay you know and and again don't be afraid to share it with somebody else and I like that you brought up reading it aloud yeah because that changes <laughs> things oh 100 percent yeah so we have some bios <laughs> of our own that we wanted to share to kind of answer some of the the thoughts and questions uh, I just want to say that the publications are normally italicized, but this font doesn't allow for italis <laughs> italics here. So um, this is a longer bio of mine. This I, I took this bio from uh, a website that was writing about me because I won an award <laughs> um, at the end of an article or something if it, my bio is included it usually ends after the first sentence or after the second one and the second one is usually shorter again i know many of you are visual or performance artists but i still think the idea of keeping it short is applicable yeah um 
I, I don't, I don't know if I should comment on why this bio works or doesn't work, but um, I did try to, it, it, it did try to include um, some basic biographical information. Um, some of some stuff about my writing practice, some things about my photo practice, some things about my practice outside of both of those. Um, I mentioned Buenesis, which is a project I'm involved with with friends that doesn't necessarily have to do with my main writing practice or my main photography practice. And I wanted I deliberately included that when I was applying for that award because I wanted them to get again a sense of who I was as a person, not just as a writer or not just as a photographer, because um, it alludes to things I care about. Sometimes I include more about my personal background, like the type of family I was born into. Sometimes I include where I was born. I was not born in Florida. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. And sometimes it's relevant. Um, it wasn't here, you know, I didn't include it here. I'm not sure if one of you wants to. <laughs> Uh, well, we already jumped. We already jumped past that. Well, I will say, I, th I think Monica's uh, bio is a lovely one, <laughs> and and I think it's you did such a great job of pointing out too where it where it can be cut so that it's just a tiny blurb at the end of the column if you've been writing. The fact that this is a longer one though makes total sense when it's on a website where you've won a grant because. A grant or an award is, you know, that's a prestigious thing, right? And so part of what's being conveyed then when people read about you is, well, why is this person important enough to have won this award or grant, right? And so we get to see all of these interesting things. And I think it's particularly challenging because the fact that you do write, you are a photographer, and then you're also working collaboratively with the research collective. And so, you know, it's like weaving those things in together it gives a nice complex picture. And yet it's still, you know, it's a paragraph, so it's not over the top as far as being too long, even in its, in its long form. So, you know, it's a, these, things are, these things are tricky. And so you should start to, I mean, to my, our audience, right? Start to pay attention every time you're reading an article on a website or in a magazine or journal, or when you look at the jacket on the cover of the book and it talks about the, the author or you're on somebody's website, take a look at all those bios and what kinds of things are said about the person under what diff in what different contexts. And it will give you ideas about, oh, well, if I'm... <laughs> If I'm writing this little column for, you know, uh, an art blog, maybe I don't need a bio that's almost as long as the column I wrote, right? Maybe I can go with a couple of sentences. Um, or if I have my own website, what all do I want to tell there? I wrote a bio, I read a bio recently that was a, like a page long. Um, and I was, I, well, at first, at first glance, I thought, wow, that's really long. Um, but when I read it, it was actually pretty interesting. And the, the, the guy was a writer and he had an interesting history. And, and I found that because I was on that website out of my interest in who it was that had been writing these books, it, I enjoyed getting that much information, but most of the time, that's not what's being asked for from us. Um, and you also find weird things. I'm always telling my students and saying, you know, it's, it, as soon as you finish a bio that you are happy with or an artist statement that you are happy with and now you've got it and you think you're good, all of a sudden you're going to get another opportunity where instead of the 150 word bio, they want a 75 word bio or they want a 300 word bio. <laughs> And, and believe it or not, like this word count thing will come up over and over again, or you'll be on some online forum where you've pasted your document in and you thought it was going to fit. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, I'm going to have to edit this thing that I wrote. And so it's really good practice to think of it like a, a kind of writer's toolbox where you have all this information, but you can kind of add and subtract or shuffle things around as, as needed, depending on who's asking for it and what and in what format um, it's required. Yeah, sometimes, I, like I said, erring on the side of simplicity and, and dryness, like straight, being straightforward is, is good. Uh, 
you'll see that these our bios have that in common. Um, but sometimes maybe on your website, you can get a little more creative, you know. Um, but for an application, maybe less so, yep. because by by virtue of having to stick to the word count, you know. So. Yep. Yep. All right. So I mean, this one is mine, right? And I will confess so that I was at first really wanting to just be lazy, and when Michelle asked me for a bio. <laughs> when she had invited me to do this um, with Monica. And I mean, there's a bio on the FIU website of me that I wrote, you know, a thousand years ago. Um, and I'd really rather not have to rewrite it as I know, you know, most of us don't want to have to rewrite these things, but I thought, well, I cannot in good conscience be talking <laughs> about writing artist bios and simply copy and paste the old bio from the FIU website at this opportunity. Um, and so, you know, your homework can be, if you're interested, you can go to the FIU website after we're done with the webinar and you can see <laughs> what did I change, right? Um, but I felt like I needed to update it a bit. I mean, because it hadn't been, um, you know, it hadn't been updated in a long time and probably I should update it on the FIU website too. But I also wanted people to get a sense, you know, on, the, on an academic website where I'm first a professor, um, you know, then there are things about the accolades, right? If the work has been published in books or if I've received certain grants, those kinds of things, you know, are, are more important. You know, if a grad student is, is coming and looking at the website, though, I think one of the things that they want to get is a flavor of well, what kind of work is going on there. And not that they can't look at the work, but I decided that I would write a little bit about what I do because I spend all this time on the, the little farm that we run mm -hmm. and hiking and kayaking. And, you know, the fact that I teach ceramics might give certain people an assumption about what that means. Um, whereas it's, it's really a little bit more I don't know if colorful is the right word, but it's definitely dirty in a different way, right? <laughs> um, and so those seemed like those seemed like some details that were important. And then I tried to be a good writer where I opened with some of that stuff about site-based practice. And then in the end, I mentioned the farm, you know, when I'm talking about the fact that I teach ceramics at FIU and I also work out in Redland, right, where my farm is. Um, and that's just kind of writing practice, right? Like how you tie together the beginning and the end. And just like Monica, I can do a very short version of this where after kayak, we stop and cut everything out until we get down to the very last sentence. And so we can keep the first and last sentence and cut everything else out. Um, and we still have a perfectly functional, you know, bio that, uh, didn't need to list all those other things. Um, and over time, you change these things again and again, partly because your, your practice changes and partly because the opportunities that are the situations in which people are going to engage you in your work change. So I think that's about it. All I have to say about this one, unless you guys have comments over it. I just want to say I really like that first sentence because I was saying your bio doesn't have to be so dry. Mine is dry because of the philosophy I was speaking about earlier, but this first sentence is, you know, it it kind of creates a, I would, I would say colorful picture of your practice. And I think, you know, there is space for something that you might find in an artist statement mm -hmm. in the bio, you know, and it's, and it's done in a really straightforward and brief way, but it's here, it is, it does speak to your practice creatively. Yeah. So there's space for that. I really appreciated this first sentence too. And I think partially because I guess I, I probably haven't read your bio aside from the one that when you said this one, but probably haven't read your bio since I was in college. So reading this first sentence, I was like, oh yeah, that is Tori. <laughs> you know, like it did feel <laughs> very familiar to this person um, that I've you know, known along the years. Um, so I thought that was really just, it's a good, it's very perfect for that. Um, I also, oh, I don't mean to cut you off. You're okay. I just, I just want to say here, not 
Everyone is a writer. Um, I love this first sentence. I love this bio. I think it's really beautifully written. Um, not everyone is a writer. Not everyone knows how to describe their practice in such a creative way that is also so straightforward. That's okay. That's what um, that's what erring on the side of simplicity is for. And that's what showing your friends is for as well. Um, and even if they're not writers, just having other eyes on it will help you make it cleaner, neater, and easier to read. So it's okay if you're not a writer. <laughs> right? And I have to throw something in there too. And um, that I think is tremendously important. I think both Monica and I have said over and over, show your friends, share it with your friends, show it to somebody else, right? Some of you might even just ask one of your friends or someone you know to write for you. Now, as a university professor, I'm not supposed to tell my students that they should get somebody else to do their writing for them, right? That sounds wrong in all sorts of ways. However, y'all know that the writing that is out in the world about artists is not all written by them. And there is no shame in you finding somebody who writes in a way that you admire and saying, you know, I wanna, I wanna hire you, or I'm gonna buy you a six pack of beer or I'll trade you a piece of work or, you know, or I'm just gonna like beg you cause you're my friend <laughs> to help me with this because nobody else can write about you and your work without being able to converse with you and you showing and telling them and giving them a sense of who you are. So it's not like cheating. It's really recognizing where your skills are. You know, if I have to ship work across the country and I'm not a carpenter, I can hire someone to build a crate. Um, if you need to write a bio and you know that you are not a writer, right? There is no shame in finding somebody who is a writer who can help you with that. Um, and um, again, I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, the bio. I think the bios are and the CVs. We got the easy job in a lot of respects because <laughs> I think that they're they're much more straightforward. You know, next week when um, when the team gets to tackle project descriptions and artist statements, that's gonna you know we all need to come back for that. Um, but all the writing that you need to do. Um, there's no shame in having people help you with that or, or do large parts of it for you. Um, the important thing is that it ends up being something that's accurate, right? That's accurate and that you can feel confident about. So you can send these things off and not be agonizing over, man, you know, my work is really, I'm really happy with my work, but all, the, all that stuff I wrote, ah, right? Mm -hmm. There's, you know, that's not necessary. Someone asked a really important question just now. Um, I don't know if I should address it now or if I should let us move into the official Q&A, but it was a really good question. But well, anyway. we're really, we have only two slides left and I guess we can actually, we're gonna, we're gonna look at mine, but we can skip mine. I don't wanna skip it, okay. Well, <laughs> we, can read, we can read mine, but we, we're very close to the Q&A. Okay, okay. okay. Oh. This way, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, mine's kind of similarly very, very straightforward. It's the things that I do most relevantly, and similarly, I stop usually around here um, for the short bios. So it's like these, these are where you can find me, right? Like if you need to find my work, buy my work, find me as physically. Sometimes you, this is where you can find me as an artist, um, and then a little bit about where I've exhibited my work. And then a little bit about why I make work, like what kind of work I make. Um, I think it's also nice to have that because this bio is one of those and bios. So it includes both sides of my practice and not just one. So um, I kind of just like a quick snippet about the other things that I do uh, as well. Um, and this is a bio I feel like I use pretty often because it's pretty, it's so straightforward. It's, it's very easy. This yeah. bio helps answer the question too, because somebody asked about um, just not having what happens if you don't have a lot of um, work to share in your bio. Someone said they were transitioning fields from science to art. And, you know, maybe, maybe they're not super, I use air quotes, accomplished in the art field. But Michelle is a very accomplished artist. <laughs> but um, so, but I, I swear this is a good example. Um, 
because your bio, Michelle, includes a lot about what you care about and what you're working on. So if you were transitioning fields and there's something you're interested in, and this is on the notes as well, this will be in the in the document people can look at. If you haven't showcased your work in, in a lot of places or in any place, a bio is a good opportunity to talk about what you're interested in, or instead of what you do work on, what you are inter what you are going to work on, um, the types of subjects you want to explore. You could just put the biographical information, like Michelle's first sentence, and then like that second to last sentence or that third to last sentence, as an artist, she explores human inter interaction through textiles and photographs. I don't think you need to have showcased your work anywhere um, in order to say that or have won an award in order to say what you care about. Um, and it ends up answering a little bit of the why, why I'm do why you're doing this, but um, sorry to skip to the q and A. I I just, no, no, I think this is a really good, even though you are a super accomplished artist, um, I think, this bio is also a good, a good way to understand how you can include what you care about, what your practice is like, you know, in yeah. something straightforward like a bio. I think also in thinking about this like idea of somebody transitioning um, from one field to another, oftentimes without realizing it, um, that work you're making may sometimes include some remnants of that thing you did before. So yes, it's you are. <laughs> in your bio because people will be very interested in it. Um, I had a friend who was, uh, she was an artist in high school, went to med school and then um, kind of quit med school to go back to making art. Um, and so she started kind of drawing these things and I was like, these look like anatomical sketches of organs without even realizing you're doing that. And so in her bio, it makes sense that she talks about being a pre-med student and leaving. Um, and I think that that's a very important thought to think about as well yeah um, art art doesn't exist in a it's not like a vacuum of a field you know it draws from everything you know and I think I think it's not it's not like I'm I'm leaving this one field and now I'm an I'm an artist like everything you've done kind of shapes your world view and what you're making and what you're thinking about so I think it's totally fair to I, I would want to know that about someone actually if they were previously a med student or a psychologist, or an engineer, or uh, you know anything, anything at all. I, I think that's really cool, and I'd want to know that. Yeah. So we kind of answered these questions already, but we, we can maybe do like a quick run through of like the effectiveness. And I think um, of all of these bios is that for sure, like the who, what, when, where, and why are kind of all answered in one in all of them without going too deep into any of these thoughts. Um, and of course we all create some like, it adds some like notable thoughts about what, what we are and who we are. Um, so I don't know, I think that all of our bios seem to be very effective in doing and answering a lot of the questions that people may have about our work. And I think that's really the big thing about writing bio, right? Is like answering questions um, about who you are. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, that's why I like your bio a lot, Michelle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yours was a, yours was such a good example. I think. Uh, are you sure you didn't write it looking at those bullet points? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about them. I was thinking right. About them. Yeah, or maybe we got those bullet points from looking at your bio. But yeah, you do a really you do a really good job with that. Oh. So we should Q and A, right? Because we yeah. have. We have short time. So we have some questions in here. Yeah. Um, so, oh, or, okay. So is this right in the right order? Yeah, so we'll go in order. So Vicki Rosenthal asks, how do we reflect our learning life, education versus college slash university degrees? Oh, I think that uh, as, a, as a university professor, I will answer that <laughs> question um, in, my funny, in my funny voice. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, and I think a lot, maybe a lot of you know this, or maybe not so much, but what somebody's sort of certifiable qualifications are is not always, one, it's not always even relevant, um, two, it's not always necessary, um, the life experience is, is a huge thing, right, and so, 
each of us, you know, you look at your own life and say, well, what are, what have been, you know, the really pivotal things, the really meaningful activities, the experiences that I've had, and figure out ways to, to share some of the details of those. Don't ever feel like without those letters behind your name, you're somehow not qualified or less qualified. And honestly, I think in art, we're in a good field for that because unless you're applying for a, a teaching position where there is a terminal degree required, people are not as interested in what your degree is as they are in looking at what is, what is the work that you do and then hearing from you about, you know, wow, where did this come from? I mean, I think the real honest question that people who are really interested in art tend to ask is, wow, how did you, you know, how did you come up with this? What, what made you make this? And we live in a time when there are so many different ways that people make art. You know, there are still people making objects and images. There are people who do performance. There are all kinds of strange practices that didn't used to be called art that are now art practices, right? And so there are lo I think there are lots of ways to take other life experience. Um, Monica's uh, comment about, you know, the, the person transitioning from science. You know, if you've raised kids or you've traveled or you, you know, whatever, you know, you held a certain kind of a job or you had an experience that's unusual in some way, or you balanced two really schizophrenically different things and somehow they, they found a way to, um, to influence each other. All those things are valuable and they're interesting. Um, I think that what is probably the most important part of this is that there is not, just like in the beginning I said, there is not a single template right way for these documents to be done. There's not a single right sort of format for the story of who an artist is and what they make. Um, each of those things is unique, you know, and the work that you do, nobody else in the world can do. You're the only one, right? And so it's just a matter of sharing with, sharing with folks what that is, where that comes from. Um, yeah. that's, my, that's my very long answer to that question. I appreciate that. Um, so the ne one of the next questions we have is, will we be able to get a copy of the slides? Yes, I'll put the link for the slides in the document that's already been shared, but I'll share and I'll share that again um, after we're done for the day. Um, then another question we have is, is a CV detri a detrimental piece when you are self-taught artists starting to look for opportunities in the art field? Which I feel like we alluded to that conversation a bit. Um, I guess, cause we, we did talk about how education isn't necessarily like everybody, like not everybody has a, an arts education background. Um, and so a CV won't be detrimental to you in that way. I think as long as you're including what you've done on that CV, but I guess you both can also add on to that. If they're asking for it, it's then, if they're asking for it in an application, you have to send one, you know, but I, um, but just to, you know, because sometimes if you, and Michelle has spoken about this because Michelle has looked at, had to look at applications before. If you don't follow the format, it becomes, it becomes difficult and confusing. And sometimes they can't even look at the, at your application. Um, but it's not detrimental. No, I don't, I don't think it is because I, I'm not on a panel of judges or anything of the sort, but I don't think people are going to look at it and think, "What this person is?" No, throw it, away. throw it away. Right. You know, they're looking at everything. You know, just right. just send it. Just send what you have, even if it's three lines. It doesn't matter. You're just just, you know, fill the bullet points they're asking for. They want a CV. Here's my CV, but it's not detrimental, even if you don't have a lot on there. Not to sound right. like Mr. Rogers or anything. Like it's all great, but. Truly, I don't. I think it's okay. Yeah, and there are really there are really limited limited situations. Like if you decide, having served on a number of search committees at the university for faculty positions, if you apply and you don't have the terminal degree, well, then yeah, yeah, that will be detrimental. But that's just that's one of the requirements, right? 
And so for most other art opportunities, they're not looking for what is your degree. Um, and so the CV, and this I think comes back to a good rule of thumb, whatever you apply for at any time, send the things that are requested. You know, don't if they request something, don't leave it out. Um, and then you can think about if you need to send extra things, there are all kinds of opportunities. They don't want you to send anything extra besides what they've asked for. So whatever your opportunities are, submit what's been requested. Be honest with what you're submitting and, and don't worry about it. And, and um, I think if you look at the, the lists of requirements, um, most institutions are pretty clear about that. And if they're not, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, most, you know, I know when Ulike was you, when you were doing your um, uh, artist support grants after COVID, Michelle, I know you talked about people asked you lots of questions, right? Mm -hmm. And you were able to help them figure out what did they need to send and, and um, what formats would be acceptable. So, yeah. you know. Um, so how, how far back should your CV go? Mm -hmm. Depends if it's the long form. The long form should go to the beginning, right? In the beginning. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't, I mean, that depends, right? If you are having trouble filling a full page, you might need to include everything, right? If you're over a page, then then that will, that will depend. And it connects a little bit to one of those upcoming questions about the gaps, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you took time off, I have two children who made a big gap in my CV in terms of some, I mean, I've been teaching all along, right? But, um, I, I went from having a tremendously active exhibition and residency and speaking calendar to really pretty minimal. Um, and you know, the, you want to be accurate about those things. Um, you know, you don't want to lie and put anything in there that isn't in there, um, but it's it's a true thing. Um, and sometimes your story works around that, right? Sometimes the new work that you do after a gap um, grows from the experiences that came out of that gap. Um, yeah. But we all have situations, right? Yeah. yeah um, sorry. No, I think you can go back as far as it needs to for what's for what you're applying for or you are still connect with that work and i i think gaps are okay because like tori said they happen yeah. and, uh, like life just happens you know and some applications will ask for something specific like i've been asked for a cv that only covered the last two years before right um i've been asked for a cv that covers the last five you know, so it's like, it, it de totally depends on the opportunity. Um, and especially in cases like someone like Anne Hamilton, who has a 60 page CV, uh, she definitely has to pick and choose what should be on the thing. Um, and sometimes thinking of a timeline might help to make a short CV. Um, so it, it really depends. Um, the next question we have is with other jobs, you have to submit a cover letter. Is a cover letter appropriate for an art CV? Um, and I guess we kind of have talked, alluded to some of that a bit. It depends on the application. Cover letters are more rare, I think, for most art uh, adjacent applications. Typically, your applications um, will also have other questions, right? So they'll ask you, like, why are you applying, like, uh, BlackRock, for example, they ask you, like, why are you applying for BlackRock? So you have to write a cover letter for that. But for the most part, um, residencies may ask for things like, uh, your artist statement, which we will learn a little bit about next week, or if it's for a grant, it's asking a project description. Um, so it really depends on the opportunity. It's not something you have to have built into your CV file, if that's what you're asking, um, I would say. Um, but I guess it, it really just depends on the opportunity for sure. Yeah. Um, and we have a question from Jen Clay. Uh, she says, is it in bad taste to include a collection section for places that you have been included in major art collections? I don't know if that's, I know, that's totally appropriate. I think that isn't collections on the list. Yeah, collections is on our list. Yeah. Um, yep. 
I think maybe uh, maybe people might be afraid it feels braggy or something, but it's what you did. Not on, not on your CV. I mean, yeah. your CV is your place to list all that stuff. I will say that sometimes private collections do not want to be yes. named by name. That's right. Correct. And so if individual people have collected your work, whether or not you include their name or their name of their collection on your CV is something you should clear with them personally. Mm -hmm. But public collections are, are totally appropriate um, uh, and important. I mean, there, there are certain circumstances where, where people look to see if your work has been collected and by whom. Yeah. Um, and then I think we have time for maybe two questions more. Um, I will say, so the document that we've already shared beforehand, that will, at the end of it, we're going to add the, any questions we missed or any questions we thought were really important to have answered today. So you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to see some of the answers for your questions that might've been, might be missed. Cause I think we still have like seven questions here. Um, but it says, uh, if you appeared in a lot of exhibitions, is it okay to say, artist has appeared in X number of, of exhibitions over uh, film festivals, et cetera. Yeah, <laughs> that was, <laughs> sorry. I, saw, I saw the question. It said something about, is it okay to say artist has appeared in over 200 film festivals, including, um, that would be something for your bio. And then I think in this, you know, you could definitely include that in your bio. Artist X has appeared in this amount of over this many festivals, including this one here in this city and this one here in this city. And then in your CV, maybe you would put all of them on your long form archival one. And then in the one you submit, you select a few choice ones to list. Okay. Hopefully that answers that. Right. And you use the subject heading of selected <laughs> exhibitions, right? As opposed yeah. to, you know. Yeah, they all are. <laughs> um, and then we have another question that says, uh, do you add the subjects and themes of your artwork in the bio, which I guess we covered a little bit of that while we talked about my bio, right. which is that um, it can be helpful for some, especially those who don't want to, because like the reason my bio doesn't have a lot of the places I've shown is because I just don't really want to. So I prefer to talk about the other stuff uh, related to my practice. So in those cases, you definitely can include themes and images or things like that, but just not too much because that's your statement is where you really want to like uh, expand on that topic. Um, is it better, so this question is, is it better to omit, omit work as, so when applying for grants and residencies as a fine artist, is it better to omit work I've done in more commercial capacities like design work for communities, et cetera, or should I only showcase things that are specifically fine art related? The examples they include textile design, tattoo work, et cetera. Um, I don't think you have to omit all of it. I, I wish I had a cut and dry answer for that because I think it's something you have to intuit based on what you're applying for. Um, it might be interesting to include some of the commercial work if, if the rest of your, um, if the rest of the information is more focused on your fine art practice or fine art based, I think it would be okay to include some of them. We were talking about that at the beginning a bit, if you wanna. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also just this, um, it depends on the relevance also. You know, if you do textile work and then you're applying for like a, a residency, they might be interested in knowing that you do textile work. Um, and I, I think, and if you're doing a, a project, for example, uh, they might be interested in everything you've done because, so thinking about certain grant opportunities or very project-based grant opportunities, oftentimes they want to know why you're able to accomplish certain things. And I definitely feel like personally for me, I've gotten opportunities because as an arts administrator and artist, they know that I have the ability to execute, right? An event, for example. So when I apply for a project-based grant, for something it's very easy for them to look at my resume and have certain things on it that make it very clear that I can accomplish these things. Um, and so it really just, you have to be really conscious about what you're applying to and how it um, relates to your whatever you're applying to. So 
unfortunately we are at 1229 uh and i i obviously don't want to hold people too too long um so the rest of these questions they've already been transcribed uh copied for me into a document that i will be sharing with uh with everyone in that big public doc that we already sent um and so you're going to be able to look at that the slides and the archive of the video again um, i'm so sorry we couldn't get to all the questions we still had like five left but i, I feel like We've been talking for so long. Um, I do want to write some answers. <laughs> I can write answers too. Yeah. I could write them in the, should I write them in the Google doc? Yeah, I have the okay. questions already. So I'll copy those into the doc and then we can answer them there. So um, I'll, it's, we have like, there's an anonymous question and we have Lee, someone who says Otter's Toolbox, another question from Lee. So uh, just be on the lookout for that document. I'll be sending it again via email after the session is over. So I just wanted to take another second to thank you, Tori and Monica, for this session. It was really great. It's been like a, this was something I've been working on since last year, and I was really excited to be able to bring it to everyone um, today. And I already feel very happy about <laughs> being able to do it. Um, and I hope you all both enjoyed being here with me as well and being part of this process because you've both been so, um, so helpful through all of it. And I really feel like we've you learn from each other through this process too. It was nice. Yeah, it's been a great, it's been a great pleasure. I've really, really enjoyed uh, working with both of you. And uh, it's also great to see so many people who've joined us and um, some old friends. Hello to all the <laughs> people who said hi. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much, Michelle, for having this idea and putting it together. It's so, it's so smart and caring to, <laughs> to put something like this together. Well, thank you so much. Bye everyone. Mm -hmm.